Hi, I'm Morgan McGuire, and I teach here at Williams College. In addition to doing scientific research on computational graphics, I create video games. Here are two of the most recent game series that I worked on, Skylanders and Project Rocket Golfing. Just like the films industry, the games industry has sort of a big budget AAA side and a small indie side. And I've tried to work on both of those in order to gain more experience. So I was a small part of the very big team that worked on the Skylander series, including most recently Skylander Superchargers. And this is a game designed for children to be able to play with their parents, kind of like a Pixar film. It has physical toys, it has a colorful world, but it's rendered in a beautiful way and it has fairly sophisticated gameplay that happens. I also worked on Project Rocket Golfing, which is a small indie title for iPhone, and that's designed to be a more slow-paced contemplative game, but it also hits a wide age range. And I'm stressing that wide age range for two reasons. One of which is that as a parent, that's what I'm personally very interested in now, games that I can play with my own children, and games that I think are meaningful for adults, but also meaningful for children. But it's also important to realize that there are many really great games in the industry that are targeted at different levels. So some are indeed for kids, and that's sort of the classic way that people think about games. But there are many games that are experiences, like film, that are targeted really primarily for adults and wouldn't be appropriate for children at all. So that's my background. Let's talk about your background for a second. Probably like most people, you've played some games even if you don't think that you have. So for example, have you played Tetris? Or have you played Monopoly as a family board game? Or maybe games that you've played that aren't as structured, like charades or riddles in a car. And then a lot of people have also played games that are something you do outside the house. So something like tennis or golf are also games. Any sport's going to be a game. And many people have recently experienced thanks to the proliferation of smartphones, a number of great, more casual titles. So things like Monument Valley or Angry Birds, or of course, Pokemon Go, which is sort of one of the first really big location-based kind of mixed reality games. Probably one of those games I listed or something like it is something that you've played. And that makes sense because the evidence is that basically everybody plays games and always has. So games are among our oldest cultural artifacts. If you go far back in the archaeological record, you always see people playing these structured activities with rules and players and winning and losing, whether it's something like chess or mancala or cards, or more recently, of course, we have video games and conventional board games. And the demographics are interesting. This data is actually from 2014, and it's only gotten more interesting. Um, in the United States, currently 60% of the population uh, describes themselves as playing games, and the demographics are well spread out. So there's an increasing number of players who are over 30. It's not just teenagers. And this data is two years old, but it's approaching 50% female as well. So it's pretty evenly distributed. Games are a really important industry economically. They're actually larger than film is today in terms of box office receipts. So the video games industry is in the United States is competing with Hollywood and actually winning on that side. And many institutions like Williams with our courses on games but places like museums and the Library of Congress have also recognized the important cultural position of games and are starting to both archive them and do regular shows on games. So that's some of the cultural background. Let's take a look at some of the reasons that we study games pragmatically in academia as well. And for this, let me take you to two points in time. One is 1879, and one of them is 2005. So let me tell you what happened in 2005 in the United States. Congress was very concerned about pollution, and they were concerned about protecting domestic fuel sources. And so they introduced a law, they changed the tax code, by saying that if you have diesel fuel and you put an additive that's an alternative fuel, such as ethanol, into it, you get a tax break. And so it's to your advantage if you're consuming diesel fuel to also use a domestically produced alternative fuel. And they passed this law with the best of intentions. Hang on to that thought for a second. Now let me tell you about something that seems totally unrelated, which is how paper is made. So paper is made through a really interesting process called the craft process, and this is from the 19th century. And the idea of the craft process is that since you're making paper essentially out of wood fiber, the waste products are all these little wood chips. And wood chips are usable as fuel. So what the craft process does is it produces paper 
from wood without needing any external energy source because it just burns the waste products that come out that don't go into the paper itself and that creates steam and the steam powers a turbine and that's what runs the whole process. So the paper industry was still using this process in 2005. It's incredibly efficient. When Congress passes the law to change the incentives and to say, hey, if you're using diesel and use an alternative fuel, you get your tax break. Well, they're not using diesel, but they are using an alternative fuel. And so what the paper mills did, is this is the obvious intelligent response, is they said, well, let's burn some diesel. We don't need diesel, but if we put diesel into the machine as well, then the diesel is being added to an alternative fuel and we get the tax break, even though we don't need the diesel. And that's, of course, exactly what they did. And this was not intended, clearly, by Congress when they were trying to cut down on diesel consumption and pollution. Now, at first, it may sound like this doesn't have very much to do with designing video games, but it actually has an awful lot to do with it because the tax code, while it's not a game, has the same structure. It has players, which in this case are the paper mills in the transportation industry, and it has rules, which are the tax code, and everybody's trying to win. They're trying to do the best they can under the rules. And so if we can learn something from studying games, which actually have incredibly complicated rules that are comparable to legal systems and taxation systems, and we can figure out how to make games fair and balanced and avoid unintended consequences, then maybe we can apply those same ideas back to the serious real-world applications of similar rule systems. And of course, there are more reasons to live life than to pay taxes. So while we study games in part because of the practical aspects like that, it's important to recognize that games are an art form. And so just like any other art form, say music, film, novel writing, other forms of visual art, we can study games for their cultural value. It's important to understand how these are made, how to analyze them, and look at what they're doing and how they're affecting us. So let's take a deep dive, for example, into a board game that many people have played, Monopoly. So if we look at how Monopoly is designed, it has sort of three pieces. There's the physical technology of the game, which in this case is cards, paper money, and the little playing pieces in the board. For, obviously, for a video game, the technology gets a little more sophisticated. But it also has content. There's art that's designed. There's a story you're being told about being a monopolist and buying things. But the key of what makes a game unique, because the technology and content apply to other media, is that games are the only ones that have mechanics. And mechanics are really what set games apart. That's what makes it interactive and engaging. And the mechanics themselves have two pieces. There's the state and the rules. And if we look at Monopoly and think about we're playing Monopoly late at night and it's getting too late, we want to go to bed. We want to finish the game in the morning. And unfortunately, we have a cat. And anybody who has a cat knows that if you leave Monopoly out at night in your kitchen table, the cat's going to get up there and start playing by itself and knocking the pieces off. So if this was a video game, we would save the game. What's a save game for a board game? It's well, we just take out a piece of paper and we write down all the information we need to put the game back where it is. And if you think about it, that sort of state of the game, the things that we would write down to describe what we need to get back to the game as we were playing it before, that's everything that really matters in the game. So we don't care what the overall orientation of the board was as long as we sit in the same places, but we do need to know things like, for example, for each player, you know, how much money did they have? Where is their marker position? What land did they own? We should probably keep track of who the current player is so we don't skip anyone's turn. And we need to know what cards are left in the deck. Now, there's some pieces of state that you probably wouldn't write down. So for example, you probably wouldn't write down what the orientation of each player's pawn is on the board because that doesn't matter to the game. That's not really part of the game. That's just an artifact of playing it in the real world. And we probably also would just keep track of your total money and not the breakdown of you know, how many $500 bills and $100 bills do you have. That doesn't really matter. One interesting thing is if you were teaching somebody how to play Monopoly, all of the nouns that you mentioned in that description are probably the ones up there. So that's the state. It's the nouns of a game. 
And of course, we need verbs that tell us what to do. How does the state change? Well, those are the rules. So when it's your turn, you know, maybe you pay rent, maybe you buy some land, upgrade, and so on. And then there are other actions. So if you do choose to upgrade, here are the rules for upgrading or for buying property and so on. And again, those are the verbs. So we have the, the nouns and the verbs, and that's basically it. That describes Monopoly and its mechanics. And this same kind of breakdown applies to video games. So video games have, have an interesting history for me here at Williams because the first video game was actually designed by an alumnus of Williams, William Higginbotham, class of 32. And his game was called Tennis for Two. Now, he was not a game designer in the entertainment industry. Higginbotham was actually a nuclear physicist, and most of his important work and his legacy is not just video games, but his important work on fighting nuclear proliferation. But before that, he made Tennis for Two. He took an oscilloscope, he invented a game controller, so he had a little knob that you could turn, and two players could move back and forth, and you were seeing tennis from the side and hitting a ball back and forth. And while for him that was kind of a, a fun, interesting diversion, there were several people in the entertainment industry who said, this is pretty big. <laughs> Let's follow up on that. So when we get Pong in 1972, they're basically, they're taking tennis for two and just making it a little easier to implement by doing a top view of tennis. So two players, they're turning dials, they're moving these paddles up and down on the screen, and when they move their paddles up and down the screen, they can try and hit the tennis ball back and forth. And then what's interesting is when we trace video games forward in time, we see that while obviously the technology is changing from the oscilloscope to the television to the CRT tubes and, and arcade machines, and the content is changing because we're going from the little blue side view to the top view to different colors, the mechanics are actually primarily the same in a lot of games. So when we get to Breakout, Breakout is just a one-player version of Pong. So here's the paddle, here's the ball, but instead of another player, we've taken out the other player and put in these bricks so there's something to do. So you're just playing Pong against bricks instead of Pong against another player. And even if we go forward to Space Invaders, 1978, we see the same thing. So the paddle we're now calling a spaceship, and we're calling your ball a missile, and the bricks are now aliens. And there is mechanical innovation in each of these. They're not exactly the same game. But you can see how the DNA of these games are going forward. And many modern games derive, in fact, from games that were originally created in the 70s and 80s. So let's take a deeper look at Breakout in the way that we did with Monopoly. Well, it's a game. So it has nouns and verbs, state and rules. Instead of money, we have a score, and we have lives. And those are the numbers that are displayed on top of the screen. And instead of moving our pawn around the board, we're moving our ball and paddle around, and there are some bricks. That's going to be all of our state. And the interesting thing is that the state of the ball object has within it some additional state. There's kind of a hierarchy. We group these things. So the ball has an x and a y position for its center. That's the horizontal and the vertical position of the, where the ball is. We need to know its speed in each direction, so its total velocity. And probably some information about what color is it, or what's the image, and how big is it on the screen. And in fact, we need those pieces of information for the ball, the paddle, and the bricks. And then the rules of the game. And what's nice here is that in Monopoly, we as humans have to execute the rules of the game. And what the computer is bringing is that it's going to follow the rules for us. So we have no choice. It'll, it'll evaluate the rules, but the rules are still just verbs. On the setup events, when it's time to set up the game, set the score, set the lives, send to the ball and the paddle and so forth, and then some other rules. Like, hey, instead of here's what happens when you land on park place in Monopoly, here's what happens when a ball hits a brick or when the ball hits the paddle. And that's basically it. That's the whole game. And the interesting part about game design is that this is where the real thinking and creativity happen, making that list in English, that bulleted list. That's what game design is about. And it turns out the other part that people usually think about, which is programming and writing code, is a pretty mechanical process. We're just translating this English design into, in this case, a JavaScript program design. Let's see how that works. I'll teach you a little bit of programming language syntax right now to show that there's not really much to it. 
Let's start with our variables. Variables are the pieces of state. This is just like variables in math. In this language, we abbreviate var, says I'm introducing a variable. But basically, I've just taken the bullet points over there and written var on the side instead. So it's sort of the same thing. Programming is pretty straightforward. Now, we need some rules. That's our nouns. Rules are abstracted by something called functions, just like functions that you've heard about in math. And their names just match the verbs over there. So here's the setup rule. Here's how we start off the game. And what we're going to do is first set the values of those variables. So we'll, we'll initialize the score to zero and the lives to three. And then when we get to the ball, the ball was this object that had complicated state inside of it. And so we're going to group together, that's what these curly braces mean, all of the state of the ball. And we'll do the same thing for the paddle and for the bricks. We can see inside the ball, indenting just like we did on the list. Here's the center, the velocity, and the image. And then the center itself groups some state, just like I nested this down three levels. So we're going to have an x and a y. And here's the horizontal, the x. We're going to say the ball starts off at the width of the screen divided by two. So that'll be centered. And then the y position, the height, is going to be halfway down the screen as well. And we just go forward with that. So let me show you what happens when I take this actual code and I'm going to run that program inside of a web browser. So here we go. So here's Brick Breaker. And this is exactly the code I just showed you. I added a little bit of graphics and a little bit of sound on top of it to make the game more exciting. So there's the ball going. It's executing different rules. There's a rule for when I push the left arrow and the right arrow, how to move the paddle. And there are rules for what happens when it collides with the sides and what happens when it goes off the bottom. Now, I promised you that Brick Breaker was actually very similar to Space Invaders. And I took this code, I put it on my website. You can actually see both the code and play the game at codeheartjs.com. But what I also did was I implemented Space Invaders and a bunch of other games so that you can compare them. I'm not going to show you the code now, but let me just show you the other game you can see that it really does work. Okay, so here is Alien Invasion, and it's essentially the same implementation as Brick Breaker. I've just gone ahead and changed out the graphics and added rules to allow the bricks to move now that they're aliens. And you can see that and many others on the website. Okay, so that's how games are implemented. Let's go a little further. There are a number of what I would call fine art games where they are intended to be played. They're things that are interesting experiences and they have all of the visual stimulation as well. But these are trying to do sort of like an Oscar movie, something that's thematically really interesting or narratively interesting or moves you in a particular way. One great game that came out in 2016 from Play Dead is Inside. And in Inside, you're controlling this small boy as he's going through this sort of military factory complex. And it raises a lot of questions about what is he doing there, what's happening, and a lot of horrible things happen throughout the game. This isn't a game for children, even though the protagonist is a child. What's interesting about Inside is, unlike if it was presented as a film, the fact that you are in control and that the themes of control and power and that all of the experiences and the good things and bad things that happen are because of choices that you've made and actions that you've taken, the experience is much, much deeper and personal than the way a film would be. It's also, of course, a visually beautiful game. We'll come back to that in a second. I want to mention the Stanley Parable because this is one of the first and most effective postmodern games. This is a game that's aware of itself as a game, and it plays with the ideas of state and rules and control over the narrative. Portal 2 is one of the best design games of all time. Portal 2 has fantastic puzzles, really complicated mechanics that keep changing. It also layers on top of that a really interesting storyline, which is done through environmental storytelling. So there's no explicit narrative. It's things that you learn as you're going through the world, and some wonderful voiceovers and performances. Gone Home, Sort of one of the first games of the really mature narrative and that tackles a lot of themes about sexuality and coming of age and relationships. But as I mentioned with Insight, some games are just awfully beautiful and effective as visual art as well as being mechanically interesting. So something like Child of Light 
is a platformer with role-playing game elements, but it also looks like a watercolor painting. It's really gorgeous. The way or if we look at Limbo, which is the effective predecessor to Inside, these beautiful game that's done by silhouettes and it's all effectively monochrome and sort of depth and a wonderful ambient music. No Man's Sky, procedural game where you explore an infinite universe of planets and creatures that are created as you go there. But it also has a visual art style that's very strong and sort of reminiscent of you know, 60s uh, sci-fi paperback. Or in the Blind Forest, another kind of watercolor, uh, more pastel styled game, great platformer as well, beautiful transitions. There's, there's sort of, you don't see menus and all of the normal artifacts of video games in there. And The Witness is a great deep puzzle game, which has this beautiful kind of impressionist art style throughout the whole game. Great, strong, saturated colors and beautiful palettes. And its notions of spaces are really well designed for a 3D game. In fact, Jonathan Blow, the designer, hired real world architects to design the spaces inside the virtual world of that game. So in conclusion, games are experiences for very different demographics. So there are games for children, but there are also games for adults, and there are some games that sort of span the whole spectrum. Games are entertainment, and that's sort of one of the reasons that they're really important economically, but culturally they're also important because they're thought-provoking and they have beautiful visual art. There are kinds of experiences you can have through interaction in a video game that can't be created in any other medium. And that's part of what makes them so exciting and compelling. They contain content like that visual art, technology like the program code that we saw, as well as obviously the physical pieces for a board game, what sets games apart is their mechanics. That's what makes them unique as a medium and enables that uniqueness of interaction. And we looked at how we can take the mechanics of games and break those down into state or nouns and rules, which are verbs telling us how to apply the state. And then we also saw places where we wanted to abstract. We wanted to group rules together. Say, these are all the rules for moving. Or group all the state together. Here are all the properties of the ball. The state rules and abstractions, you can apply that to the tax code, to legal systems. You can apply it to games, but computer science is actually not the study of computers. At the time it was named, computer meant something different. Computer science is the study of state rules and abstractions and learning how to design systems under that. And that's why I teach in a computer science department. Thank you very much for listening. You can see me either in academia, on Twitter, and in industry, and link to all the things that I've showed you today, or my sort of academic side. I have some game recommendations in closing. Recall that we said for video games, there's this big budget AAA kind of games, and there are many amazing things there. Here are four of my recent favorites. On the indie side, there are also these smaller, more intimate experiences that are really interesting as well, and a lot edgier, and hundreds of great board and card games, that's really been an area that's been exploding in design lately. And when you're done playing, if you want to do some reading, here's some fantastic books that I've really enjoyed.